Good afternoon from a rainy, dreary, cold San Francisco on this Good Friday. Julie, I trust you are well. I am. Any hot tips before we get going? Getting warmer. <laughs> I hope so. It's cold outside. It is. The Commodore of the Beach Street Yacht Club, my celebrated landlady, the coordinating producer of this show, Julia Vadekent. I'm your host, Tom Eamon. We're delighted to have you all with us here for show number 698 on this Good Friday, Holy Week, if you're celebrating it. Uh, Easter, of course, on um, Sunday. We had Maundy Thursday yesterday. I can't keep track of all these things, Julia. And Easter Monday and coming up. Coming up, that's celebrated in a lot of countries. They yes. have the day off on Monday. We don't really celebrate it here. In fact, mm -mm. I remember growing up, uh, we had half a day of school on Fridays. Mm -hmm. Did you? Yep. Half day school. You go home, you were supposed to be quiet from noon till three. That was the time, supposedly, that Christ was on the... That's what we were told. That was the time that Jesus Christ was... In a public school? In a public school, yeah. Ooh, this is, you know, in the Midwest, in Michigan. <laughs> Do you know what Michigan means? Actually, I don't In, know. It's one of the Indian, one of the Native American languages. It means great waters. Oh, I guess I read that someplace. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. A lot of people on here already. Probably a lot of you have the day off as well, whether you're in the States or beyond. Saturday down under, Ed Worley saying hi, Gordon Smith. From Herlev Hospital, smashed knee, tibia, and fibula. Oh, my goodness. Was that a bike accident or something else, Gordon? Yeah, I, I read that. Oh, Awful. dear. Oh, hope you're feeling better. Oh, dear. Pedro Foiling Sailor is listening in from Fiji. That sounds nicer than the horse pistol. It certainly does. Fritz Mueller in Miami. David Price. Uh, Price, he's had his ups and downs health-wise, but I think he's on the mend. And uh, great news from David and Christiane about their daughter, Olivia, who has now been named to the Olympic team again. Oh, good. James Frederick Bland. Hello, Boomer, it marked safe from the Marisk, Singapore Dali. Yeah, yeah, indeed. <laughs> it's raining in San Francisco, fog machine knows well, and snowing up in Tahoe. I don't know, it could be snowing here in the marina for all I know, Julia. Brick Banner, <laughs> hi from sunny Long Island. What kind of Easter bunnies lay the best Easter eggs? Steen Stingray wants to know. I don't think I want to know the punchline to that joke, though, Julia. <laughs> Do you? I don't know it. I don't either. That's why I said I'm not sure I want to know it. Uh, Holtzman, hello, Joe, up in cold and snowy Estes, Colorado. Peter Taylor in New York City. Gordon Smith, uh, I, I asked uh, by text, I texted Gordon earlier to ask if he could put, put, uh, send more details on the Shanghai clock that his family, apparently his grandfather or great-grandfather, yeah. installed there on the Bank of China uh, building in Shanghai. I'm currently otherwise, I, yeah, I see you are. Okay, so... You're excused, Gordon. Sorry yes. to hear about your accident. Great waters and great land, Holtzman is saying. Joe, of course, originally a Michigan boy. At least that's when I met him. Banner O, feel better. Everybody giving best wishes. Carico, Pete, you're in Annapolis. Well, we've got a little update, Julia, from our Fozy John Captain Jack Schaefer about what he thinks happened. He has some insider scoop about that ship and the okay. bridge. Okay. Greg Phillips on the Gold Coast of Australia. He sent some funny jokes. 
Steve Gruber asking to know what class is Olivia Price sailing in the Olympics? She is sailing the 49er. Playboy bunnies. Um, uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't think about that. Yeah. That was Fog Machine asking that if, as if that were, he, he doesn't know the punchline. Geechee mm-hmm. Gumi, Big Water. James Frederick Bland knows, and that, Julia, is from which song by James Taylor? It's from a, a, a poem by... Uh, uh, well, it's it's the James Taylor song, right? About the, the from the shores of Gichigumi to the great. But it's the sinking of the ship in Lake Superior, talking about ships. Mm-hmm. Chris, actually, hello, Chris and Rick Banner. Obviously, it's a grandfather clock in Shanghai. Gordon Lightfoot Banner gets it. Not did I say Sweet Baby James Taylor? Gordon Lightfoot song, the Edmund. Fitzgerald. Fitzgerald. Well done. The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald by Gordon Lightfoot. Thank you very much, Fog Machine, who's a.k.a. Amadeus, a.k.a. The Poodle. Do you know who that is, Julia? St. Francis Yacht Club member? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, I do. Can you come up with his name? Uh, They're all coming up with the names of the Indian word Michigama, meaning great or large lake. Mm -hmm. Edmund Fitzgerald, yep. Everybody is so smart on here. Yes, including Lance Burke, Lance, yes, Lance Burke, yes. who is DBA, DBA on here, Fog Machine. So yep. welcome, everybody. We've got a great show ahead. We just want to start by wishing all of you who celebrated a happy and blessed and peaceful Good Friday. And I like this lesson. The lesson of Good Friday is to never, at least for maybe Christians and non-Christians alike, is to never lose hope. Or at least give it 48 hours. <laughs> what do yeah. you think of that, Julia? I think it's perfectly appropriate. Huh? Appropriate. Never lose hope, or at least give it 48 hours. And it was like this morning, it, I said, Julia, we got like uh, 40 minutes to air. We got to get cracking here. And we managed once again to get on the air for this show. Yes. And we've got a good one for you. Uh, in the meantime, what are we celebrating today, Julia? Here is your first and only clue. Does anybody know what we are celebrating today? This is an, actually, besides Good Friday, it's another holiday. David James, welcome to you across the bridge saying, always look on the bright side of life. Indeed. He went to Stanford, so he's, he's a bright boy. Yes, he is. Isn't 72 hours, three days. What are we celebrating today, J. Frederick Bland, Julia? Well, it looks like... Uh... Power. <laughs> Which falls? Looks like the horseshoe falls. Lance Burke is correctly observing. That is Niagara Falls. That's the horseshoe falls. Not the American Falls, but the horseshoe falls in O Canada. That's part of Niagara Falls. And we are celebrating today. After having seen Iguazu uh, in uh, falls. Well, yeah. that's that's hardly a yeah, that's hardly a comparison, right? It's but in huge. terms of volume, this one's a big one in terms of volume. And we're celebrating Niagara Falls Runs Dry Day. Oh, my. Yes, I could have used this as this day in history. It happened back in the 18-somethings, 80s. But they have an actual holiday to commemorate the day that Niagara Falls ran dry, 19, uh, 18, rather, 48. March 29th, 1848, the day when a bitterly harsh winter gave way to ice on Lake Erie which gradually broke away. Strong winds drove the ice to the mouth of the falls or to the Niagara River, yeah. thus suspending the flow of water for over 30 hours. Some of the first to notice the unusual event were nearby mill owners who realized that their water wheels had stopped turning, mm-hmm. rotating. Soon, hordes of people inched their way to the falls to witness the odd event they were able to witness for the first time since, presumably, how would people know? the formation of the Niagara Falls, absolute silence in place of a roaring waterfall. Several people ventured across... How stupid would could you be to do that? <laughs> no. Several people ventured across the riverbed finding old ammunition used in the Battle of Chippewa in 1814. At night, hundreds of people reportedly made the trek across the riverbed with lit torches in their hands. And I've never heard of that. I have not either. I had no idea that that happened. 
And Gruber says, when the falls ran dry, did they collect all the barrels of dead people from the bottom? I'm not sure people have been doing that in 1848, three years before the start of the Modern America's Cup. Christopher Gillingham checking in. Happy Easter to all the Fozy. Fair winds from Chris and Jane. A little more on the Niagara Falls. It remained dry until the afternoon of March 30th when the winds reversed their direction and everything <laughs> returned to the way it was. And as to those people venturing out, look at that. Uh -huh. Okay, it looks a little frozen too, icy cold, but there no water and they're out there on the rocks where the water would normally be rushing by and over right. the falls. And, you know, there's a couple of women, a couple of guys, a couple of men, it looks like, a child, a dog. What were they thinking? <laughs> To prevent this from happening again and to maintain the flow of the falls for hydro, well, hydroelectric purposes, each year a nearly three-kilometer ice boom is installed at the mouth of the Niagara River at Fort Erie, consisting of 22 connected steel pontoons that are anchored to the bottom of the river. The boom greatly reduces the amount of ice that enters the river. Now, that much I did know. But I didn't realize that that, that was in reaction to what had happened back in, what, 1848. Mm. And it's a celebrated deal on the Great Lakes, particularly in Buffalo, New York, at that end of Lake Erie. And here is um, <laughs> the end, which was just a couple days ago, on the 27th of March. The New York Power Authority, which it puts out this boom, along with Ontario Power, informed the board of the, the, the International Niagara Board of Control... <laughs> that they have placed all components of the ice boom into dry storage as of March 27th, concluding the 2023-24 season, which apparently is getting shorter and shorter because of the somewhat warming climate. It's been super cold. Well, it has been, but uh, I think big picture long term, it's been warmer this winter, and it has so that many of the so recent past winters. I mean, I've, I can say that Anecdotally, we used to go skating on our lake, give or take, in Michigan, southeastern Michigan. There'd be some ice forming around the the edge of the lake at more or less Thanksgiving and maybe the first week of December. And certainly by Christmas time, we were able to play hockey on the lake and carry on. Right. But um, some years in the recent past, yep. it has not even frozen. Ugly windmills, Ed Worley observing. Yeah, indeed. Did the name... Did they rename it Niagara Doesn't Fall? <laughs> Just asking for a friend. As Andrew Pindar squeezing in an SI visit after Friday early doors and the risk of dinner being in the bin. Thank, uh, I think I just about got away. <laughs> Welcome, mm -hmm. Andrew Pindar, to you. Uh, it's a good Friday in San Juan del Sur in Nicaragua. There's Ralph Hewitt is down in Nicaragua. I'm not sure we've ever had anybody sign on from Nicaragua. Welcome. It's Yes, we have. Have we? Mm -hmm. uh, you have a better memory than I. I like Nicaragua. <laughs> you do indeed. Julia Vatican. The, the brain trust of this show. Speaking of brain trust, we appreciate mm -hmm. and we celebrate, as we are today, those other things. We celebrate all of you who do give us a few bucks per month. A buck, ten, five, fifteen, hundred or more to help keep us on the air, keep our studio fitted out, the computers working. We're dropping zero frames again after a adequate testing, I guess, and I think we have solved yeah. that problem. Warren Schasser checking in from Brisbane in Australia and Don Lunabos from across the bridge in Sonoma. And the Fozy, wherever you are, and uh, we appreciate all of you, especially those who are patrons who have contributed via patreon.com slash join slash sailing illustrated. Theme of today's show is uh, the Olympics. It's less than four months now. The opening ceremony is on the 26th of July, 2024. And we're going to feature some, some of the latest news, some things that not necessarily about sailing, but about the Olympics that maybe you have not heard about. I hadn't heard about it. Uh, and David James saying, at least we still have a bridge, <laughs> meaning I, the Golden Gate Bridge here. Yeah. Julia, Rick Bannerow is saying, Julia looks resplendent. Resplendent, I think he means resplendent, in her jonquil yellow outfit. Is that what you call that? Yes. Jonquil? They're, they're flowers. Oh, they are. Jonquil. How do you say it? In French? It's French, isn't it? Yeah, but... Jonquil. 
I, but it's... Um, we we anglicize it. it and say Jean Quill or John Quill. John Quill, yeah. Very appropriate for this Easter weekend. And yes, I wore a matching. I saw when she, I was leaving hair and makeup to get dressed, and I saw Julie was in that bright yellow, so I had to match with my dull yellow. It has to be bright yellow on a gray day. Well, it is. Boy, it is gray, too. Uh -huh. It is gray. Gray, cold, and rainy. <laughs> Me. It's going to be that way all weekend here, I guess. Let's get on with a brighter shade of pale here as we're going to celebrate the Olympics. Great scarf, too. Oh, Julia's attire is... Thank you very much. I like this scarf, too. Is that Hermes? Hermes. No. Yeah, Hermes. It's not. Britton it... Ward is in Barcelona. He's checking in. We're going to get... Britt on the show as soon as his team, you know, he's with American Magic. As soon as the team will let him on to come on when these AC-75s all get launched. First launch is coming up. We've got news on that. Luna Rosa Prada Pirelli. Joe Holtzman says, not yellow, but maize. Uh. Is your jacket maize for maize and blue, which is what the Michigan corn color and the Michigan University of Michigan. Yes. Uh, let's do some follow-ups before we get to John Emmett's report. Follow-ups from... Tuesday's show, we told you, of course, that the Black Foils, the new name, I like that name. Not all of you liked it, but I like these teams having nicknames like the Golden State Warriors or the Detroit Lions or the Man United. What are they? The Man U, somebody help me. I don't know. But they won the ITM Sale GP in Christchurch last weekend. As you know, we talked about that on Tuesday's show. We celebrated their crew, at least the members of the crew whose names we knew. And we also gave a big bravo Zulu to Fozzie Jody Shields and his sidekick Chris Steele, a Kiwi who did the radio commentary for the first time that they've done. Uh, the Russells allowed a radio commentary, and it was almost spot on. It was a, a few seconds ahead of the video, at least as, it, as I was watching it on YouTube here in the studio, B at the Beach Street Yacht Club. And uh, most of you said the same thing, that not only was their commentary excellent, but that it was well-timed with the video. So you, you could watch the radio and know what was about to happen on the video. <laughs> Listen to the radio. I was going to say. Listen to the radio yeah. and know what was about to happen on the video. Also, give a little follow-up because Russell Coots and most of you were not amused with he uh, with his a bit of a temper tantrum. Some people called it mm -hmm. on Sunday morning on the radio interview he did after Dolphin Two, uh, Dolphin Saturday. After the Dolphins were the winners <laughs> on Saturday, the winner was Flipper. We said yeah. because they called off racing due to Dolphins apparently being in the racing area, and of course. I, I can't remember the figures exactly, but he said something like that that cost $760,000 that weekend. And well, guess what, Julia? What? You'd think poorly of me if I didn't have the figures. Oh, okay. <laughs> what is it? I'm coming to that. Oh, sorry. I'm coming to that. Because well, it wasn't, I mean, it was more than an inconvenience. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, John Lambert's Van Buren's on about time zone changes. We'll remind me later, John, and we'll get update everybody on that. But back to Russell. Julia, as usual, is a step or two ahead of me here. And Russell gave this infamous interview with News, News Talk ZB, which is among, if not the largest talk show, the talk radio. Talk, they call it New Zealand Talkback Radio. And we just call it talk radio here in the U U.S. But Russell's Sunday morning... Uh, trooped over to the broadcast booth there and gave this long interview, read a statement, and I finally got a copy of the statement, which I oh, thought good. you would be interested. Yes. But not before Russell got um, criticized heavily by Greenpeace for his statement. Russell Coote signs up to the war on nature with sale GP threat to Hector's dolphin, which some people claim is... Um, and some of you said, by doing the, re, the, the research, said that it is, in fact, endangered. Others, including Russell, called it a lie. Remember that? He yeah. said in that radio interview. Yeah. Russell Coots' shows, and this was a, an editorial by Paul Lewis, who's not a, never been a big Russell Coots fan. I'm not a big Paul Lewis fan either, but I, I know him, and he's a, he's a decent reporter. And uh, Paul said in the uh, New Zealand Herald yesterday, Russell Coote shows he's not like most New Zealanders 
through sale GP dolphin fiasco. And I won't bother you with the whole editorial, but it's it was very, uh, uh, shall we say, uh, critical of Russell. So I thought we should see what did Russell actually say in his statement that he read. And it's a long statement. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to reprise the whole thing. But he read it on talk News Talk ZB on Sunday morning. And I, I, just to preface that, I think part of what he was doing was to put pressure on the organizers to let them race on Sunday. Because if they, yeah. if they weren't able to race on Sunday, and he, of course they didn't race Saturday, and if they hadn't raced Sunday, the whole weekend would have been lost. They would have had to refund all the money to the Correct. spectators, yada, yada. Right. And it would have been a, a bigger mess than it, than it even was. So let's see what he said. And again, this is an excerpt. Uh, several uh, excerpts, paragraphs here. Of course, with any decision like this, there needs to be a balance. For example, one could say that because there is a chance of a road death, that we shouldn't be allowed to drive on the roads. I suspect most people would conclude that such a stance would be far too extreme and not practical. Inherently, as a society, we accept an element of risk in our daily lives. Julia, I'm not sure I would have said that. Mm-hmm. It seems a little cavalier, but if I were advised, and I did advise Russell and, and wrote his press statements and releases or co-wrote them for any number of years, not sure I would have said that, R.C. Seems a little cavalier to me. But wait, there's more. The depart- He says, the Department of Conservation, ECAN, uh, ECON is it? I don't know what ECAN is, and Littleton Port Company have enforced services upon sale GP which he says is an international company with its main offices in London and New York. I'm not sure I would have said that either, Russell. It comes off as a bit haughty and, you know, we're, we're big and worldly and, you know, we kind of looking down on you Kiwis. Hmm. Uh, that are not required, that is, these services are not required and not demanded anywhere else in the world. And I can imagine Kiwis saying, so frigging what? Yeah. <laughs> Yet are never let the less, nevertheless imposed as a condition for allowing the races to proceed in Littleton. The cost, here you go, Julia, yeah. from those unrequired services total approximately three hundred thou, I assume he means Kiwi, which is, you know, the right now the Kiwi dollar is a little depressed uh, to the US dollar, but it's still real money. Three hundred thousand Kiwi. In addition to that, there are eleven, follow the money so-called expert dolphin observers that are being paid New Zealand $600 per day each, plus their expenses in a program that totals, apparently a cost to sale GP, of 78000 Kiwi. It's a lot of money, and it seems over the top. I agree with Russell in that respect. I don't know what you all think. Please put them in the comments, and we'll go back and read them. Russell goes on to say it was demanded that those dolphin observers be on site from Thursday onwards, so four days, at $600 a day. That's real money. Despite the harbor master reducing practice on Thursday to around 11 minutes of sailing. These are costs and services that SailGP doesn't face anywhere else in the world. Again, I'm not sure I would have said that. I would have just pointed out the money involved. In conducting this event, Sail GP alone is ex- is spending approximately New Zealand dollars five point five million. The looked into, I say he says spending. I think he's meaning that's the impact that Sail GP in this event is putting into the local economy. It didn't come out clearly there. Of course, our international teams also go to considerable effort and expense to send their teams to New Zealand to compete, and it's fair to say that they are also not happy with the way this program is being managed. SailGP distributes live broadcasts, get this, to 212 territories worldwide, and many of those broadcasters, including CBS in the U.S., turned the feed off well before the conclusion of the live broadcast window. Okay, that's no surprise, Julia. Right. But again, I think you can hear the Kiwis saying, oh, well, you know, tough, tough luck, RC. Okay. There are a lot of considerations in managing an event like this, yet almost none of those are being properly considered. I remember he's saying this Sunday morning before they raised Sunday. <laughs> Not being properly considered by the environmental and harbor authorities here in Christchurch. 
The fact is almost all of the people here in Christ Church are incredibly supportive and positive. I'd like to thank all of those people who have made us feel so welcome. I feel sorry for the fans, local businesses, and all of those people that are, who are so proud of this incredible city that the event has been so disrupted. Let's hope we finish with some sort of great racing today. I think I would have opened with that. Mm -hmm. Julio? Yes, it was probably, yeah. You've told me many times you attract more with honey. What? Yeah. More flies with honey, more friends with honey. <laughs> My mother used to say the yeah. same. Okay, so that was, I'm going to come back to the, your comments in a minute because I go on to say that I found an article in researching this segment. I found an article in Time, on Time, what is now, it used to be Time Magazine, but it's now Time.com, from last month. Meet the sailor who thinks his sport is the next Formula One. I thought, man, that sounds a little over the top. And then mm. I read the article. And I, again, I excerpt. First, Formula One got hot in the United States and beyond, thanks in large part to a Netflix series, Drive to Survive, which, by the way, is dying in the U.S. of late. Mm -hmm. But it did. It was very popular last season and earlier this season that showcased the circuit's personalities, rivalries, and some really fast cars. Then there's the pickleball craze, which is an old people's version of tennis, which started during the pandemic and hasn't lost much momentum. That's unfair. Pickleball is fun for everybody. But what niche sport will get hot next, the writer interviewer for Time asked. According to Sail GP, his article says, the worldwide broadcast audience per event through the first half of this season is up nearly 24% over season three. I didn't know that. It's great. Reaching 13.6 million viewers. The league's social following has grown by 56%. And in no, you know, if it went from one to two, but I don't know what these percentages are. in but, you know, probably. Well, no, in terms of, yeah, viewers, but how many viewers did they start with? So you, you never know until you see the raw numbers. Mm. But in November of 2023, 1.784 million viewers turned, tuned into the CBS broadcast of a race in Spain, a sail GP record for an American audience. That was the most watched sailing race in the U.S., sail GP claims, since 1992. It outrated the Formula One race that day from Brazil, which mm -hmm. drew some 900, excuse me, 909,000 viewers on ESPN2. That month, I take a gulp of coffee, that month a group of investors led by Avenue Capital Group CEO Mark Lazary, former owner of the NBA's Milwaukee Bucks, one of the best teams in the league, by the way, mm -hmm. purchased Sale GP's U.S. team in the largest transaction in league history. Mm -hmm. The group, that's the U.S. team. The group also includes actress and producer Issa? Issa. Issa. Issa Ray, world champion heavyweight boxer Deontay Wilder, and ex-U.S. soccer player Josie Altador. And that's interesting news because they're not all necessarily old white people. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. Why do you have faith that Sail GP can come the, become the next Formula One? Russell was asked. Well, he said audience growth is the first thing. Second, the commercial model is strong. We started selling teams between 5 million and 10 million. Now you can't buy a team without 35 million. That's news. Mm -hmm. At least news to me. Yeah. We know we've got demand for teams. We can't build boats fast enough. We didn't think we'd be in this position before the end of season five. And of course, they're just three quarters of the way through season four. So the fact that we're already in that position is pretty encouraging. Similarly, with venues in season one, in season one didn't charge anything. We basically pleaded with venues to let us host a race. Whereas now there is competition, they may have paid some venues too. Mm. Whereas now there is competition. We accept venue fees from most venues. That's becoming quite a big component of our commercial model. One more. 
What are some of the key metrics that seem to show that SailGP is on the right path? We started out with six teams in year one. Now we've got 10. All six of those teams were funded by the league. Now five of the 10 are funded by investors who bought rights to those teams. And we're closing in on two more sales now. So seven of the 10 will be funded from the outside. And we're going to add two more teams in season five. More news. We've heard rumors of that, but mm-hmm. I, I think that's real news. Mm-hmm. We started out with five events in season one, last paragraph. Now we've got 13. We want to try to get to 20 plus events in, in a season. We want 20 plus events. We want to get to the stage where there are events every two weeks or so. That's roughly what Formula One does. Julia, what do you think of all that? Well, that's ambitious, and actually, it's probably very good news if, if all the the um, uh, the, the uh, underlying factors are correct. Indeed, if it's all true, if it, none of it's fake news, and I, you know, I take Russell at his word. That's from this article. I posted it on my Facebook page this morning. I think I did. I was trying to, and then Facebook was down for a few minutes. Uh, that's from an article in uh, Time, what used to be Time Magazine one of the two big news weeklies here along with Newsweek, both of which now are websites, uh, from the 18th of February by a gentleman called Sean Gregory. And it's a long article, much longer than that, and I, I commend it to you. There's the bridge. There is the famous Baltimore Francis Scott Key Bridge. And as you know, it Tuesday morning before early Tuesday morning, 01.30 our time or something like that. Was it 01.30 Eastern yes. time we Eastern. decided? Eastern. Yeah. So uh, Monday, late Monday night, our time, uh, that bridge went down after this f- container ship hit it. Uh, one of our foes <laughs> sent this. There are rumors. The rumors are wampant, <laughs> as Wad Davis used to say. There are rumors all over the place as to what happened. And no, it's not true that the captain or one of the pilots was taking selfies as they approached the bridge. That is simply not true. But Ted Ryman sent that along and we had to find something light Mm. about this very serious issue. Very serious issue. And Captain Jack has come to our rescue. This is our fuzzy John Schaefer, Captain Jack, as he's known, in Annapolis. Uh, we would have put him on the air today, but he's in Lake Geneva with his father. And remember we had John on one time driving across the, the, like the Indiana or the Ohio Turnpike, <laughs> driving, and <laughs> right. he was being interviewed, the multitasker that he is. And I said, now, Captain Jack, send me some Send me some paragraphs of, of what you think is going on, some verbiage, and I'll see if we can get you on the show and we know more about this in due course. But he said, he, Captain Jack, said, the loss of power by the generators and propulsion systems was the initial cause factor. Losing all of it at the same time could be the fuel. Maybe they had contaminated fuel. I've probably seen the video 20 times with narrated pauses and slow motion. Of course, when you lose power, you always try to restart the initial, and that's what you see when the power was restored to have the engine go in full reverse to stop the ship. You can see the black smoke, not emit, I I would have used a stronger word, pouring out when that happened. You can see that in the video. Mm. He goes on to say that coincidentally, that is when the ship starts to turn to starboard. When the second power outage occurs, the rudder kicks in to her left, to the left again, and when the power is restored, the second the turn to starboard resumes, so the starboard, so the port anchor was dropped, because that had power to drop the anchor. The port hook would tend to give her some left turn. Now power added in full reverse, when a vessel goes in the reverse, and I prop wash, I think he means, prop wash sends her back to the right. To me, the vessel is out of control, so you try everything to stop it. I would also assume that some crew went forward to release the brake. Those men are those are, are probably heroes, the brake on the anchor chain. The Mayday call stopped all the bridge traffic, so pretty much it couldn't been it could have been a lot worse than it was, especially if it was 
later in the morning, yeah. uh, approaching or at rush hour. The tugs were called back, but didn't get there in time. I think the Bay pilot saved a lot of lives. So that's his take. Mm-hmm. Julia, did I hear that there was one, they recovered one truck of, or something with a couple bodies in it that weren't the pothole filler. There were guys on the bridge filling potholes apparently. Yeah. But was there one car, one vehicle that did go over? Yeah, I think I, it, I heard it, that too, but I, I I don't know much about that. Oh, prop walk is correct, not prop wash. The prop walks. Okay, he's walking the stern one way or another. Yeah. Okay, let let me finish I, this up, and then I'll go to all your comments. <laughs> Julia, do you want to say something? I, um, I just I just heard, um, the um. You think about it, and I'm going to come to the caption. Yeah, go. I'm told that this is the costliest, I heard on the news this morning several different times, costliest maritime disaster in history, not just the cost of replacing the bridge, which is going to approach a half a billion dollars, 400 million U.S. just to rebuild and to take over four years, but the economic impact of just for the workers who today... This mm-hmm. week can't I, get across I, the bridge to their jobs and the port that's that's way being shut down, et cetera, et cetera. Did you think of what you wanted to say? The, the, there was a a uh, captain of a of a similar boat, and he said this kind of cutoff uh, does happen not infrequently at sea, and um, and uh, <laughs> gosh. They um. Oh, this kind they, of cutoff. What kind of cutoff? The, the engine just sh- shutting down. Just shutting down. Just shutting down. Oh, okay. And but at, at sea, it's not so much of a problem because there's well, not a big exactly uh, bridge there, and and that they didn't have time uh, to do it. They couldn't uh, drop their anchors. They couldn't. Well, it, exactly. The power went out and yeah. it went out twice. Exactly. So and the, your your late great husband, of course, Conrad, Captain right. Conrad, was a ship captain for many many years yes. on big ships running from Europe down around South America and over here, and eventually he landed here and was in charge of shipping in the Pacific for Hamburg Sud. Yeah, here. Yeah. Okay, let's um, let's go to the comments. I'm going to go back up to the top so that Steve Gruber and others don't get upset at me. Now Hamish Ross, yes, Hamish is on here. It's Saturday morning news. He is back. He said he was pretty jet lagged. I saw his post on Facebook. And um, let me see if I did one up far enough. Let, let me go further higher. Be, it'll be above where you are um, seeing in the comments or on the list. Ted Ryman, I completely agree with Russell Coots. If they were concerned about the Dolphins, then they should not have allowed the race to be held in Littleton in the first place. He should send those people the bill. Well, okay. Uh, Peter Selwyn doesn't agree. He's a Kiwi saying the fact is that this event was booked to take place in a known and well-publicized marine mammal sanctuary. He has to live with all the possible consequences Mm -hmm. of that decision. So I think that's a pretty good uh, pro and con, Mm -hmm. isn't it, Julia, of those two. So let me leave it with that and not do any more except to say Jody Shields saying that he had 17 thousand listeners tune in to sail gp on the on the lock i think he said uh, he didn't say 1.7 thousand he said 1.7 no 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 (laughs) no no he's i'm sure he means 1.7 thousand because he was kidding about the fact that that he had one no no he had a bunch of people and by the way he also just to remind of of, we asked on the show the other day if you could watch it and listen to it and replay and you can oh good it's up there now on his facebook page yeah i didn't i didn't get to it yeah Okay. Uh, back and forth, Peter Selwyn, Andrew Pindar, yeah, Hamish. Hamish is back from Finland. We're, I don't have anything in today's show about that, but with help from John Lamberts, Van Buren, and Hamish, we may even get them on here to talk about that uh, that festival, that, that, that whole forum up there. Oh, that would be good. Helsinki. Yeah. It was good. Uh, what else? Uh, Morris Stevens, let's get to Morris' comment. She doesn't often comment. She's always on here watching, but she's left a long, pithy comment here. It's long and pithy, or that means the opposite. <laughs> the solution, she says, is simple. Sail GP does not 
have to race in Christchurch. Oh, wait, they decided to return to Christchurch because they could not come to an agreement with Auckland. I wonder what CLGP was asking for that, so that, that was so unreasonable. I was, I'm wondering what CLGP was asking for that was so unreasonable that there was no solution. You would think that Auckland would be pleased to have the event, especially since they are missing out on the America's Cup event. Hmm, interesting thoughts anyway. Yeah, good points, more. I'm sure, yeah, as usual, yeah. follow the money. Yeah, dirty fuel, Steve Atkins is saying, yes, dirty fuel. That's what John, you, you heard John saying that he thought it was dirty fuel. Peter Taylor, the ship is reported to have had power issues before it left port, following up to see who signed off on its release from port and the fix, contaminated fuel being examined as a root cause. Prop mm -hmm. walk is correct. Okay, it has influenced the propeller rotating the ship's direction. Got it. Just like any, like any single engine ship, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's turning, the prop's turning. It's just like on a sailboat. Hamish, it's, is it just me or are others getting a sound cut every few seconds? All right, are you getting? Our audio here is perfect. So I hope it's not us, Hamish. Uh, big difference between billions of F1 fans and millions of sale GP. Yeah, Rick Banner, I, I think comparing oneself to F1 at this stage was a little over the top. Sound seems to be okay in NYC. Uh, Hamish, check your device. Reboot, maybe. Uh, yeah, Hamish says, I look forward to it, Tommy. Truly great event for classic yachting. We'll get Hamish on here. Maybe John, John Lambert's Van Buren, who's we keep saying we're going to get them on, and maybe we'll get the two of them on in tandem. Uh, all good. Okay. My Hong Kong master and engineer license, J. J. Frederick Bland is saying, uh, his license exam emphasized dirty fuel problems and fixing them as well they should. Okay, so this is a disaster. We're going to follow it. Thank you to Captain Jack, to John Schaefer for that update. And remember, he is uh, very well connected in with our federal government, and not only being from the Chesapeake Bay, but very well connected in. He is a hostage negotiator. He flies around the world when hostages are taken by pirates, by terrorists, as well as um, he, he is connected at the higher, highest levels in our federal government. Let me leave it at that. Hi, Alex Hayworth. Sale GP would exist without Ellison's financial subsidy f1 is self i think he means would not exist without ellison's financial subsidy mm -hmm. well to get it off the ground yeah he's clarified that f1 is self-financing and top teams make a profit indeed okay i think we're up to date on the comments thank you to all we probably already had 100 comments bloody hell julia mm -hmm. um let's get to john emmett's report before we get to our feature of the day which is this ceremony on uh, the River Seine, the opening ceremony, as well as some other facts and uh, factoids and tidbits about the Olympics coming up in less than four months. And with John, we have his usual coach's corner. He is in China, in Shanghai, at what we're told the name of that event is actually the, Chi the, the Shanghai Sailing Open. And we're going to show you a little bit about that in a minute. Remember, we talked on Tuesday about Shanghai, that fabulous city. That's a great picture. The yeah. Bund, which is that the waterfront front area where the financial district is and still really, it was and still is, and where the expats, the foreigners, lived for much of the last century, and the 1800s through you know, into the 1900s. And that clock there on the, that's the Bank of China building, I'm reliably informed. And again, our thoughts out to Gordon Smith, who's in the horse pistol, having had some kind of an accident. Mm -hmm. And the uh, clock was apparently designed, built, and installed by Graham, by Gordon Smith's, what, grandfather was it? Gordon, remind us. And I, I tried to get some verbiage from him and he promises in due course. That's the Bank of China building with the famous, I call it the Smith family clock. <laughs> Here's John's report. Hi, Tom, Julia, and all the Fosy. Time for a quick walk and a talk. Really nice weather here in China. Uh, I was actually going to take you for a little walk and talk around the boat park, but I didn't fancy bringing the, uh, the camera equipment to there. 
We've uh, got lots of racing going on on uh, Dishu, I think that's spelt right, Lake, uh, and it's actually quite nice. Uh, Lily's here racing in the J80s, but we are literally those ships which pass in the night. <laughs> so the uh, Ilkas are racing um, around 9.30, 9, 9 o'clock on the final day, and because of the size of the water, uh, we're sharing it. So pretty much the same course, Windward Lua type course, with um, the J80s, so they're racing in the afternoons. So they start racing um, at 12.30, so it's all very efficient. Now, for my room, where I nearly did the the walk and the, sorry, well, I nearly did the piece of the camera, uh, I can actually watch the racing. I'm just not quite sure uh, what the uh, colour of Lily's uh, spinnaker is. So we're super close to the venue. In fact, I quite happily walked back because I had a little bit of boat work to do at the end. And you will be able to see uh, some of it as uh, we get closer. So it's really nice being so close because there's no chance of me getting lost in China because it'd be pretty hard for me to uh, ask directions. But this is just absolutely amazing because I last came here around 12 years ago and there was no, no big buildings. And if you look behind me, I mean, it's just, it's just all big all big buildings. It's absolutely amazing how quickly and how much this has just grown up in, wow, a decade. And it's been an amazing experience. I will try and put some stuff on uh, YouTube. Uh, we had two full days of touring organized by the uh, Shanghai Sailing Cup, two full days. And then we had, you know, collection from the airport, lovely hotel and uh, you know they've even given people uh, invitation money to just try and attract the best possible people there is um, it's unfortunate obviously the timing is close to Palmer uh, but that's just what it works out so all this has been built as a scientific area uh, to bring all the top scientists uh, the world into one place just like China built a uh, a table tennis city. Um, they've also uh, built a theatre city and this is their science city. So uh, some of the museums we went to, it really reminded me of uh, going to NASA. So I'm not actually going to cross over the road, but I will try and show you just how close I am. So all those white sails <laughs> in the distance, that's the fleet going around the Windward Mart. So I'm actually going to go back to my room now because uh, I have a fantastic view when they put their spinnakers up. But yeah, I think China is an uh, amazing place. And one thing we all need to do is to think about just trying to promote sailing as a sport. You think how many people are in China? That's an awful, awful lot. Oh, that's too scarily close. <laughs> That's an awful, awful lot of uh, potential new sailors. And they're obviously keen. They pulled out all the stops. Actually, uh, Lee, the uh, president of World Sailing, was in attendance. And we have uh, live uh, media. I'll leave uh, Tom to comment on uh, how good the commentary is, because uh, I haven't quite been able to understand it <laughs> in Chinese. But yeah, for this little regatta, they all have uh, tracking, live um, live commentary and uh, I sort of get the feeling how famous people feel because it feels like I can't go anywhere um, without them uh, taking photographs. So they've, they've really done a, a huge amount of effort to publicize the event. And actually, for example, the Orca class, we, we don't have live commentary. In fact, we don't even have the trackers at our World Championships. So they've set the bar really high. And the reason I say that is actually the World Championships for the Ilka 6 and 7, in other words, the Olympic classes, is going to be in uh, China next year. So if it's anything like the setup they have here, I think it's going to be absolutely amazing. <laughs> so yeah, it's funny, I don't think I've ever had so much time off. I'm going to go back, have a little rest, and uh, maybe I should practice using chopsticks. Okay, bye for now.
practice using chopsticks. Your wife is Chinese. You've been living with her for how long? How are your chopsticks usage, Julia? I'm fine. Exactly. I know. Are all the chinnickers, are, are they all symmetric? Stingray is asking. <laughs> Riskiest video. There's nobody around. It's Look at it. It looks like the empty quarter. Trackers don't reduce the cost of boats sailing just saying, J. Frederick Bland. Yeah. Well, uh, I think part of what's going on, Julia, is that the president of World Sailing and the, the yeah, Chinese, Chinese sports authorities want to be sure that the sport is being well represented while he is president, while yeah. he's there, and they making plans accordingly. But also, maybe sailing is on its way up. I'll tell you what, Lily Zhu is a big Oh, she is. Deal. I, I, in doing the research for what I'm about to show you on this, uh, I, I, I saw lots and lots of coverage in Chinese of Golden Lily, Li oh. Zhu. So let's uh, have a look at that after John's report. And uh, thank you, John, for that. But here is the cup. Shanghai Sailing Open. I really like that video, and that's yes. uh, I, I. I won't tell you how difficult it was to download that and put it into the show. It's not on YouTube. It's not on Instagram. It's not on Facebook. I'm probably now being tracked by the Chinese government. It's not on TikTok. It's I'm probably being tracked by the U.S. government because I was using yeah. dark sources. Uh oh. To get that video in the first place, I mean, yeah. I could find it. It was it was around, but to then get it and get it downloaded was not exactly easy. Well, I'm proud of you, but it also is is uh, symptomatic of how much we will be having to do that. I mean, that's it. Exactly uh, right. That's why I did it. Yeah, I yeah. better figure. I spent probably a half an hour trying to figure out how to download that because if I play it right off the internet and onto the show, it it's, it causes all sorts of problems. Interesting. They're on a lake. They're not out, as one of you is saying, they're not on the river, as as uh, Lance Berg, fo a.k.a. Fog Machine. Sailing in the river by the bund would be horrible. Lots of river traffic, not much wind. Exactly. Well, the lake apparently is a pretty good spot to do it. I thought it was a terrific video. Uh, that's John's report for today. John Emmett sailing. Get to the front of the fleet with John, and we appreciate him helping us out every Tuesday and every Friday with our show. The mensch that he is. Bravo Zulu is next up. Dark sources, not dark sauces, Graham Sweeney. <laughs> <Barbecue. laughs> the dark web. Uh, Bravo Zulu here to, uh, while we're in China, I thought we should cover the Rolex China Sea Race, which is going on. In fact, they're about, uh, I think they're within 100 nautical miles of the finish in Subic Bay in the Philippines. It's another one of these, give or take 600 mile offshore races that's become quite a deal mm -hmm. and that is underway it started a couple days ago and they are closing in now on the philippines they they race from hong kong down to subic bay in the philippines and here's the preview video from rolex dynamic diverse and most definitely distinct here it comes now heading pressure here we go stand by <laughs> The Rolex China Sea Race starts from Hong Kong's imposing Victoria Harbour on Wednesday, the 27th of March. Getting out of the harbour is always very tactical. There's lots of tacks, lots of boats, sometimes there's other vessels, container ships coming through the harbour. Organised by the Royal Hong Kong Yacht Club, the race is Asia's premier offshore yachting event and attracts a top-class international fleet. You start in the city. One hour later, you're out at sea. Good luck. First held in 1962, the 565 nautical mile race follows the ancient trade routes 
through the unpredictable open waters of the South China Sea, before transitioning into the Luzon coast and entering the pristine waters of Subic Bay in the Philippines for the finish. Lovely way to watch the sunrise. Overcoming the constantly shifting weather patterns plus challenging overnight conditions places a premium on tactics, tenacity and teamwork. I tell the guys you're fighting in the trenches and I'd like them to fight in the trenches the entire way to Subic. Returning for this unique test of seamanship is 2023 overall winner Nick Southard's Whiskey Jack. And Ernesto Echao's Standard Insurance Centennial 5 will also be back, having last year become the first ever Philippines entry to take line honours. We're so happy that we were given the opportunity to be able to express ourselves. Thank you. It's just one of the most sensational sailing experiences, I think. The Rolex China Sea Race, the jewel of blue water racing in Asia. Okay, that's the preview video that was out a couple really months nice. ago. Yeah, and yeah. I, I saved it till now. We covered this race last year. It used to be a biennial event. Mm -hmm. And it started in 62, I think they said. It's, it's the 62nd anniversary. It's the, okay, it's not, yeah, anniversary, I guess you would say. Yeah. But it, it, it fell off the map for a while. For five years, they didn't run it. And then it came back last year. And then they've run it again this year. Apparently, it's going to be an annual event. They do a good job of the PR. I'm getting a press release every morning at 0300. And not that I'm waiting up to get it <laughs> and read it. Yeah. But nice uh, film, as Andrew McIrvin said. They're doing it in association with the ROC. And Andrew's saying it's a nice film. Sadly, only 21 entries. And maybe it's because they've done it uh, two years in a row. But again, bravo Zulu to them. It is happening. And here is the race course. It's a straight shot once they get through the narrows there in Hong Kong, down to Subic Bay, which used to be a huge U.S. naval base back World War II and beyond. And it's, um, again, bravo Zulu to them on what is a cool race. And yeah, 21 boats, but at least they're doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's hosted, of course, by the Royal Hong Kong Yacht Club. Those of you who know Hong Kong know that the, the Yacht Club's over on the island side. It's not on the Kowloon side, mm -hmm. right at the, the foot of one of the tunnels. It's a beautiful club. It is a beautiful club. Fantastic facility. They have the mm -hmm. best cigar bar. Not that I'm a big cigar smoker, but I have I have indulged from time to time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Particularly, I'll do that face again. I want to see that face. <laughs> One more time. <laughs> I, watched, I was watching it out of my eye here as I'm looking at the screen. Yeah, uh, they have a wonderful cigar bar, and it's a, and the food and the, the, the tell you what, the wine cellar there. It's too. elegant. Uh, yeah. It's elegant. The place is nice. It's not the nicest looking building from the outside of if they don't mind my saying. And there is the Royal Hong Kong Yacht Club, mm -hmm. which has a storied history, as you can imagine. Two years before the AC Zero in 1849, the Victoria Regatta Club was formed and later absorbed into the Hong Kong Boating Club, which in 1889 was in turn merged into the Hong Kong Corinthian Sailing Club. Mm -hmm. At the general meeting of the Hong Kong Corinthian Sailing Club held in October of 1893, a resolution was passed that application should be made to the Admiralty, the British Admiralty, for permission to call the club the Royal Hong Kong Yacht Club and to fly the Blue Ensign with a distinctive mark on the flag. A warrant was granted by the Lords of the Admiralty on the 15th of May, 1894. Greg Newman is asking, what? Cigars? A wine bar? Where is this Unicorn Yacht Club? <laughs> Hong Kong, where else? Yeah. Uh, early members were British only, with military personnel on board. Until the 1950s, membership was exclusively reserved for Europeans. Women were not allowed to be full members until 77, when Patricia Loosby became the first female member. Today, membership is open to all, and indeed, they have a female Commodore, whom I don't know, I haven't met, but she's there in the middle of this 
picture of some of the luminaries at the uh, opening ceremony for the China Sea Race, the Rolex China Sea Race 2024. Her name is Lucy Sutro there in the middle and the Royal Hong Kong Yacht Club Commodore. Lucy Sutro mentioned in her welcome speech that for several decades, Rolex has cultivated close associations with the best known yacht clubs and organizers of major events in the world of sailing. How true that is. Quote, we are honored that this race was the first Asian sailing event sponsored by Rolex and proud that with their support over the last 16 years, the race continues to arouse, I like that word, mm -hmm. arouse attention within the international yachting fraternity. So a nice quote. Yes. And it's getting a lot of media coverage in Asia. So as John said, you know, if China and that whole area keeps, to, keeps growing our sport, whether it's dinghies or big boats, it be, can't be anything but good for the sport, right? Right. One can only hope. Here is a video that aired just in the last couple of days on uh, what's called the China News Service. Have a look at this. About the start. I guess I should read this. The China Sea Race organized by the Royal Hong Kong Yacht Club started Wednesday. This year sees an international fleet of 21 boats. The race starts at Hong Kong's iconic Victoria Harbor and ventures over 500 nautical miles to Subic Bay in the Philippines. Reported by somebody, this is the China News Service, which is an English language news service normally, but they do it actually in both, both in three languages. They also do it not only in Mandarin, English, of course, but also in Mandarin and in Cantonese. I learned that this morning. Mm -hmm. um, easy to get to. It has a nice gift shop open to the public and an online store. J. Frederick Bland is talking about the Royal Hong Kong. Rick Bannerill, and what will Warlord T.S. Ping <laughs> make of such decadent capitalism? wonder if Rolex gave uh, Mr. Uh, the, the President a Rolex to cover coverage of the event. I don't know what that quite means, Rick, but we'll, we'll pass that by for a moment. This is the start you saw in that video. And Standard Insurance, which is the Philippine boat that was first to finish last year, seen here. It's the largest boat. Uh, Alongside another boat that is a top boat, this was the boat that was first to, we're going to feature them in a moment, but was, sorry, first on corrected time last year. And here's another video from the race committee. From an impressive Hong Kong Harbor, yes. Victoria Harbor, technically, yep. is the, where the Royal Hong Kong Yacht Club is. But people are enthused, excited as the boats start all on the same line. Jamie McWilliams did a great video commentary at the start on Facebook, Andrew McIrvin is saying. And there are two of the favorites starting at the pin end. Long race, 500 nautical miles, so, or just, is it, it's more than that. It's just short of 600 nautical miles, I think. 565, basically. Was it? And, you know, round about what the Bermuda race is and the mm -hmm. Fastnet and even Sydney Hobart. Yeah, so 600 and change. Mm -hmm. Getting a lot of ink and good ink for the sport. There's a link uh, to the... <laughs> to the brand of clothing at the Royal Hong Kong in the comments. Thank you, Boomer. Boomer Bland. Oh, that's good to have. We dedicate this segment to David James, who I think is still a member of the Royal Hong Kong. I lived, think so. lived there for a while and mm -hmm. raced Etchells, among other things. Mm -hmm. Our friend here and has sat in for you, Julie, at your table when you were out of commission for yes, a while. He sat in for you. He for knows a, couple a of shows. lot about. About you're uh, bragging about another Stanfordite. I am. 
the Stanford. So this boat, Happy Go, is the boat that was uh, one uncorrected last year. I think it's a TP-52. We'll talk about them more in a moment. This is the first entry ever, first ever Korean entry into the Rolex China Sea Race. Uh, and there's some other commentary here, but um, it took them 18 days to bring the boat to Hong Kong. So that's nice to see that there is a boat from, and also from, from Taiwan, Taipei, China, as they call it. Taiwan, as some of the rest of us call it. This is the Philippine boat, Standard Insurance Centennial 5, that was first to finish last year. We featured them on last year's show. This is the owner and skipper, Ernesto Echao, Echaos, owner of the Reichel Pew 75, Standard Insurance Centennial 5 from the Philippines. He's no stranger to this offshore race, having participated in nine editions and having his name twice engraved on the China Sea Race Trophy. He has a member of his crew who is a female, a top sailor from the Philippines, we're told, and we read, Paula Bombeo, who's sailing aboard Standard Insurance. She is one of 21 women on nine boats. Good showing. Yeah. In mm. the Rolex China Sea Race 2024. So bravo Zulu to all of them. David, David uh, James chimed in with a couple comments. He's, yes, he's still a member. And it says it's the largest yacht club in the world with about 9,000 members. Largest? Well, at 9,000, I can imagine it is. Clark Chapin, you better get cracking. I think at Portage Yacht Club, we're lucky to have 90 members. 9,000 members, Julia. That's mm -hmm. unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Well, it, the, the women participating in our sport, our, I've used it now for the first time, beloved sport, mm -hmm. continues to rise. It's nice to see. Um, <laughs> John Schaefer. They're not all rice, I, I don't think. I think there's probably some potatoes in that mixture of 9,000. Certainly David is. Uh, Whiskey Jack, the J109 that was first uncorrected last year. They do sail like most events in the world outside the U.S. sail on, under IRC. Whiskey Jack, the J109, is owned by Nick Southward. From uh, He's a Brit who lives in Hong Kong, and his crew, Mick McCool, I didn't have the crew names last year, and I've since found them. Mick McCool, Rob Berkeley, Tom Carter, Peter Davies, and Mark Lyons. This is the crew last year, and I... Don't know if it's the same this year, but that's uh, 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 Bravo Zulu to them. Apparently, they're a highly competitive boat in any number of races out of the Royal Hong Kong Yacht Club. And then there's one also crew, one double-handed crew, father-son crew, who are getting a lot of ink, a lot of ink, and uh, here's why. Well, is it going to run? No, it's not because it's a promo slide that I was going to do the setup for. Then I was going to run the video. All the way along the race, we see plastic bags, plastic uh, polystyrene boxes, all sorts of bits and bobs of plastic. Cosmas Grelin and his father, Philippe, are among 20 teams who set up from Hong Kong's Victoria Harbor on March 27th for the 2024 edition of the Rolex China Sea Race. The Grelins have sailed together for 20 years and along the way have become committed environmentalists after seeing how the oceans are increasingly littered with plastic. It is now one of the most serious environmental problems for Earth's waters. Every day, about 3.2 billion pieces of microplastics flow through drains and out to seas near Hong Kong alone, according to local researchers at City University. Plastic waste even affects sailing races in open waters. Yeah, so last year, we, on our way down to the Philippines for the race, we got stuck in a big piece of plastic which slowed us down a huge amount and uh, potentially prevented us from winning the race. During the biannual race through the South China Sea, vessels sail 565 nautical miles in four to five days from Hong Kong to Subic Bay in the Philippines. Uh, usually people uh, ask us if we are fighting on board, but we never, we never fought, you know, so that's all right. Uh, it's, we, we are very complimentary. Uh, there's a sort of natural harmony between us, obviously, being father and son. There's a sort of 
natural chemistry that goes on there, which is uh, an advantage for us. And also the fact that we're just two on board, it makes communication a lot more simple. Uh, a lot of teams that we're racing against, their crews are between six to, you know, up to maybe 20 people on board. According to a study by UK-based environmental consultancy, Unomia, 12 million tons of plastic flow into the world's oceans every single year. Another recent study estimates that over 170 trillion microscopic pieces of plastic are now present in the world's oceans. All the way along the race, we see plastic bags, plastic or polystyrene boxes, all sorts of bits and bobs of plastic, which end up, you know, just breaking down into smaller pieces and then end up being in the fish's food. And then it, we end up eating the fish, so it ends up in ourselves. So it's really important that we try to raise more awareness about the negative impact of plastic on the oceans and try to reduce as much our consumption of it and even more importantly just making sure that we dispose of it properly. And so this year we decided well let's uh, team up with a Plastic Ocean Foundation to fight against plastic. The Hong Kong charity has been fighting the scourge of ocean plastic for over 10 years. A Plastic Ocean Foundation regularly organizes beach cleanups as well as scientific initiatives such as coral restoration. Their overall aims are to reduce plastic and restore marine ecology. We believe that by reconnecting people and communities to the ocean, we can bring okay, it back. This video goes on for a while and it becomes a bit repetitive, but it's uh, the point is the race and these the father-son, bravo Zulu to them because they're bringing awareness to what is a problem we all agree is a huge problem. I think we do, we're left, right, and center, right? Mm -hmm. Politically yeah, yeah, and I think so. otherwise. Uh, you don't have to be a, a big lover of the dolphins or a big believer in climate change or not to understand that this is a huge problem. And bravo Zulu to them. And more importantly for our sport, this aired in and on the South China Morning Post. This is, a, you see the logo in the upper left corner, that's the South China Morning Post. Is that the name of it? South China Morning Post. Um, they produce videos, and it's a lot of these news outlets that used to be the, the you know, big newspaper of the English language in that area, all, all throughout China, the South China Sea. So, Andrew Pindar is saying, yeah, good to hear reference to the consultancy Unomia, their CEO, Jean Quiel. Oh, there you go, Julia. Mm -hmm. Jean Quiel Hackenberg is also the chair of the Magenta Project. Okay. Mm -hmm. Small world. Love how many tens of millions of electric cars are now being adopted in China. Yeah, indeed. Uh, um, and Graham Sweeney saying, by the time humanity finds a way to reduce microplastics, I'm going to put this video, let it run while we talk over it. By the time humanity finds a way to reduce microplastics, our bodies will be so used to having it within us, we won't be able to live without it. Mm. Well, who knows? I'm going to listen to these father-son one more time. ...of the kids, the new generation, you know, just to explain that the sea is not a rubbish dump and uh, they have to be careful uh, not to put the plastic in the sea because the plastic in the sea will end up either in the fish or on the beach or on land, you know, and it's very, very bad for the environment. It will take years and years to degrade, you know. Myself, I've been in the waste management for all my life, uh, professionally, so I know what it is in terms of plastic recycling. I know that we can do it, or at least we can avoid to use plastic, so, you know, it's important to uh, push that, that angle. Okay, here's a nice closer here. And thank you again. I'm going to give them some credit, the South China Morning Post. Mm -hmm. I think you've met Mary Crowley, who's around here, who's been very active worldwide. Indeed. Didn't she just talk at the Wednesday outing luncheon yeah, with she her did, daughter? But, yeah, but she's, she, um, I mean, she's been at it for 25 years or more. And may, for a while, really sort of the only one. <laughs> around it, doing it, and and uh, she's done a great job. Um, she has indeed. Well, I don't think we'll get her on the show, but that's another issue. Fog Machine, a.k.a. Lance Burke, says, sort of hard to go against advice given the Dustin Hoffman <laughs> and the graduate. 
Remember Plastic. that? Plastics. Plastics. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks for that nice report. Thanks to what's a cool regatta. And yeah, there are only a hand, you know, less than a couple dozen votes, but um, it's nice to see Rolex again helping out a cool regatta in you know, the four corners of the globe, if, if there are not more corners than that. Mm -hmm. What about uh, this day in history, which is a nice lead in to today's Olympic uh, feature? Have a look at this, Julia, and tell me what you think happened to this day in history. 8.45. Oh, my gosh. That might have a tie-in. 8.45. That might have a tie-in to the Paris Olympics. There, I've given you another clue. Uh, Here's another clue. Hmm. See if anybody comes up with it in the meantime. Do you recognize that? I don't. If that bridge I should recognize. The first Olympics in Greece. No, Clark, J. David James, once again. Aha. Uh -huh. The Siege of Paris is what that is. And uh -huh. who was the siege by? Well, it started on the 28th, 29th of March in 845. The Viking Siege of Paris begins. And here are the details. It was the culmination of a Viking invasion of West Francia. The Viking forces were led by a Norse chieftain named Regent Harris. Did I uh, even come close? Sorry. Or Ragnar. We know him by Ragnar, who mm -hmm. tentatively has been identified with a legendary saga of the character Ragnar Lodbrok. Regent Harris, i sorry, a fleet of 120 Viking ships carrying thousands of warriors entered the River Seine in March and sailed up the river. Graham Sweeney calls him Rollo. <laughs> Rollo Ragnar, Rollo. Mm -hmm. Not the founding of Paris, quite the opposite. Uh, the Frankish king, Charles the Bald, ah. <laughs> assembled a smaller army in response, but after the Vikings defeated one division comprising half of the army, the remaining forces retreated. The Vikings reached Paris at the end of the month during Easter. They plundered and occupied the city, withdrawing after Charles the Bald paid a ransom of 7,000 French, how do you say that? Livre. Livre. Uh, which, uh, who knows what that was in today's money, but it was a king's ransom, no doubt, in gold and silver. Mm -hmm. Rick Banero says, Charles, Charles the Bald is my king. <laughs> so that's what happened on this day yeah. in 845. Paris is ransacked sacked by Viking raiders, probably under this guy Ragnar, who collects a huge ransom in exchange for leaving. Which, go ahead. I, I knew knew about the, the siege, but I had no idea of recollecting the year. 845. Is that where Easter eggs come from? Charles the Ball. <laughs> uh. So that gets us to our feature of the uh, Olympics coming up less than four months. And the first piece of news, of course, is you probably knew this. I don't think we featured it, but I think you probably knew this from the general press. Paris 2024 uh, innovation, the unique Seine River opening ceremony unveiled. This is from the Olympic website from about a year ago, so it is not exactly new news, but I think it's time to focus on it for a number of reasons. Paris 2024 will break new ground by bringing the sporting competition into the heart of the city. And the same will be true for the opening ceremony, which will take place in the heart of Paris along the Seine River. The parade of athletes, which traditionally takes place within a stadium, will be held on the Seine with boats for each national delegation equipped with cameras to allow viewers watching on TV and online to get a close-up view of all the action. That's nice. The opening ceremony of the Games will be the largest held in the history of the Games, in terms of viewers. It will be open to all local residents from Paris and its surrounding region, along with visitors from all over France and, indeed, the world. And, Julia, they had... They've scaled them back now because of terrorism yeah. concerns. But you were able to watch it for free all up and down the river, up in the 
on the roadways up on either side of the river. And then down on the river level, they were going to have paying customers, and a lot of them. So here's some details on that, because they're a little concerned now with the situation in the world. Right. And here is that report from a couple days ago, maybe maybe a little bit long, a couple weeks ago, on CNN Sports. Paris 2024, the Olympic opening ceremony capacity has been slashed in half to ensure security. That's too bad. Attendance capacity at the 2024 Olympic Games, the first to be held along a river, first to be held not inside a stadium, will be halved due to security reasons. French Interior Minister Gérald Darmanin said Tuesday in an interview, this again a couple weeks ago, with French broadcaster France 2, the minister said there was no specific terrorist threat targeting the Olympic and Paralympic Games, but... Some 104,000 people in stands will line Paris' Seine River with a further 220,000 on raised roadways along the six-kilometer, nearly four-mile stretch of the river that will host the ceremony, Darmanin said. So we'll see how that all goes, but they are planning, Julia, to cut that back, and I'm still really concerned about an open-air opening ceremony inviting all it's as I said to one of, in fact, to a dear friend in Paris, well, in north, in the northern part of France, the other day, I said this looks like a terrorist's wet dream, no pun intended. You know, you got, I'm sure the the gendarme, the the police and the yeah. military are going to be patrolling that whole area intensively. But man, oh man, it sounds. I mean, you look at what happened in Atlanta. Look at what happened in 1972 in Munich. And the world is even perhaps a rougher place now than it was then. Now, uh, apropos the cost of the Olympics, this is usually an issue at this stage in the Olympic Games. There starts to be a lot of publicity. Indeed, there was a big protest a couple days ago, or now last week. And that sign in French, I'm reliably informed, says, cash for civil servants, not for the Olympic Games. And the AFP reporting... Uh, via France 24 in the last couple days. Paris Olympics to cost taxpayers 3 to 5 billion euros, which is up quite a bit from what was originally promised to be the cost to the taxpayers. The Paris Olympics this year are expected to cost the state between 3 and 5 billion euros. The French National Auditor said Tuesday, as new figures revealed the country's widening debt levels. He said, the auditor, we still don't know the cost of the Olympics. Pierre Moscovici, the head of the uh, auditing body, told France Inter Radio, these games will cost between three, four, or five billion euros. Talk about not knowing what they're going to cost. Mm-hmm. Moscovici or VC, how would you say that in French? It looks like an Italian name. Yeah. Had estimated in January last year that the ultimate cost to taxpayers would be around three billion euros which represented an increase from the government budget estimates at the time of only two and a half billion euros. The bill for every Olympics often expands in the later stages of preps as unbudgeted costs appear or extra funds are needed to accelerate unfinished building work. Julie might say in for a penny, in for a pound, (laughs) right? It goes on. Making cost comparisons between games is difficult because of a lack of transparency with figures and the complexity of comparing investments across countries. But a 2020 study by academics at the University of Oxford concluded that every summer game since 1960 had gone over budget. With the average sports, I'm not so sure that's true about 84, at least the, the bottom line budget was not didn't. Uh, it was quite good in 84. With the average sports-related costs ending up between two and three times the original estimate. I lied. There's one more paragraph. The most, nostor- most notorious overspends occurred in Montreal in 1976 and in Rio in 2016, where both cities were left nearly bankrupt and mired in debt. I think they finally paid off the bonds in Montreal just in the last year or so as well as Athens in 2004, which contributed to the country's debt and financial crisis ever since. 
Uh, Paris organizers had promised sober games using existing sports infrastructure for 95% of their needs to keep new construction and costs down. Yeah, John Schaefer saying L.A. was the only one to actually make money. That's right. true. And Peter Huberoth, who headed that up and ran it, did a fabulous job. Clark Chapin, the Olympics are often a good example of the 90-10 rule. You consume the first 90% of your budget to complete the first 90% of the project and another 90% to complete the final <laughs> 10%. Mm. Where does Clark come up with these things, Julia? I don't know. He's very clever. Chris actually above Clark saying hosting the Olympics gets less financially and logistically feasible with every instance. John Schaefer on security saying, and he, again, he's an expert on this stuff. They will not even be able to get through private security. They will not even be able to get enough private security. The Brits could not do it. There's no the way the French can. Yeah, I, I'm a little concerned about it, but what do I know? Now, wait, there's some more news that I know Singray and John Emmett and a few of you will be interested in. It's just the IOC has just announced that uh, they are excluding Russian and Belarusian athletes from taking part in the Paris Olympics oh, they are. opening ceremony. Oh, the opening ceremony. The opening ceremony. The opening ceremony on the 26th of July will see thousands of athletes, as we've just told you, travel on boats down the Seine River for several miles toward the Eiffel Tower instead of the normal parade of teams inside a stadium. The International Olympic Committee said athletes from Russia and Belarus who are approved to compete at the Olympics as neutrals, you all knew that, will have a chance only, quote, to experience the event, unquote, likely watching from near the river. So they're not going to get to go down the river on a boat. Russia and Belarus are barred from team, team sports, team sports at the Olympics. This is a detail I was of which I was not aware. Because of the war in Ukraine and the IOC has laid out a two-step vetting procedure for individual athletes from those countries to be granted neutral status. So presumably that applies to our beloved sport. There, I said it twice now. <laughs> Those athletes must first be approved by the government governing body of their individual sport and then by an IOC-appointed review panel. Neutral athletes, I don't know how anybody will have qualified, but maybe some have, given the restrictions on qualifying events. Neutral athletes must not have publicly supported the invasion of Ukraine or be affiliated with military or state security agencies. Hmm. So that answers some of the concerns that uh, were raised by some of you. Mm -hmm. It is unclear if membership of a Russian military sports club, such as the CSKA, will be a reason for denying neutral status. The IOC said Tuesday it expects about 36 neutral athletes with Russian passports and 22 with Belarusian passports to qualify for the Paris Games. A decision on whether those athletes will be allowed to take part in the August 11 closing ceremony will be taken at a laser, later stage, the IOC said. Any medals won by neutral athletes will not be counted as a collective group in the overall medals table. The IOC also revealed, it revealed details of the replacement flag in jade green that will be used for neutral athletes at medal ceremonies where a specifically or especially written anthem without lyrics will be played. That from an AP article by the esteemed Graham Dunbar, whom I don't know, but he is highly thought of by a friend of ours, Julia, who works for the AP. Mm -hmm. uh, this is an article from the 19th of March, so like, good, 10 days ago. Uh, Graham is based now in Switzerland, American-based in Switzerland. So there is some Olympic news, not on specifically on sailing, but generally. And we'll start to focus in now on Marseille and what's going on down there, because that, of course, is where the yacht racing, the Olympic sailing, will take place. And they'll have their own. If, if other Olympics with remote venues for sports like sailing are, if that's the example that's being followed by Paris, we had a little opening ceremony, for example, in Savannah, Georgia, when the games were hosted, the main games were in Atlanta, and that's typically been the case. 
uh, when the opening ceremony, uh, when the Olympics were in Barcelona, right off the Athletes' Village there, right about where the America's Cup racing will take place later this year, we all went to the opening ceremony, and the judges, I was a judge and official, we were all sat right at the base of the cauldron of the flame, and we saw up close and personal mm. oh, the, 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 what do you call that, the guy that shoots the, the arrow. The archer. The archer, up close and personal, and that was cool. That was cool. They also have, have. They had switches to turn the flame on and all that stuff. I know, and 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 send by archers too that you don't see. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm sure they had that thing back. Oh, it's neat. It, I like it though. Well. No. Um, what are there? Gosh, there are lots of comments. There are lots of comments. I'm sure that punishing the the uh, Russian athletes will end the war. Steve Gru. I I agree, Steve. I I just. After I went through and experienced personally that whole thing in 1980 um, as executive director of U.S. Sailing and having to go down and argue, as all of the sports did, with the USOC, who said, we are, we agree, and they were arm-twisted, they were coerced right. by the federal government, Jimmy Carter, and that his government, that we are not going to Moscow. You will boycott the Olympics. That will put pressure on Moscow to end the war in Afghanistan. Yeah, right. And not yeah. only that, then the U.S. ended up going into Afghanistan, and we were there for almost 20 years. Yeah. 19 years. Unbelievable. So where do neutral athletes march in the ceremony? They don't, Ed. They watch it from, it sounds like, the sidelines. Mm -hmm. There's Larry Kennedy checking in, the head of the bimbos in Long Island, the Brotherhood of International, not the Brotherhood, they now have renamed it because it's men and women of international mark boat operators. Yeah. Uh, are there any of them favored in the Olympic shooting event? <laughs> Thing, Ray. Oh. Athletes should not be penalized for the sins of their leaders, even if they were in the military. This politicizes sport and cannot legitimize athletes as target, i.e. 72. Yeah, I hope there are no targets. I, uh, but, John, I agree with you, and I know others of you don't. Some of you think the country should be banned full stop, and that's the end of that. But, Julia, what do you think? I, I end up feeling sorry for the athletes that have worked eight to four, four to eight years or more or more and then then get up to you know 10 weeks before and you say oh sorry well it's it's more than 10 weeks it's been this whole two week period two two year period of yeah. the war but nonetheless um, Julia we'll cover some more we're going to focus in on the Olympics now that we're less than four months away to the opening ceremonies and I thought that was a good general overview of the latest news that I had seen. I've learned, I learned a lot from that. I did, too. <laughs> I did, too. I learned a lot from every one of these shows, which is part of the reason I love to do them. Yeah. To say nothing of sitting in the same room with you. Oh, yes. You know, That's grand. For a couple hours on yeah. Tuesday and Friday. Yeah. Any other comments, pithy or otherwise? Seeing none, we'll move smartly forward to the last leg. We're an hour and 33 minutes into this show. The, the last leg to Gloucester by Thomas Hoyne, that painting that I know Morris Stevens likes probably almost as much as I do. Yeah, David James saying the Olympic boycott in, back on that comment for a minute, <laughs> the Oli that Olympic boycott worked out brilliantly, didn't it? Yeah, both in 80. And then, of course, the Soviets, the Eastern Bloc, boycotted the 84 games in L.A. Right. A lot of good that did. I just, the opening ceremony sounds very impressive. I just hope it's secure. Chris actually agreeing with my concerns about that. As I said, I'm talking with somebody who is um, a, a fozy. He watches the show, and he and his wife and kids live, they used to live in Moscow. They now live in northern France mm -hmm. and is very well tuned in to the situation maybe almost as well as Captain Jack is. Oh. And maybe your friend John Gomes, who mm -hmm. works for our State Department, Yes, for example. Okay, enough of all that. I'm dropping hints, but we'll not <laughs> drop any more than that. We told you on Tuesday's show about the Sunday departure from TF Green International Airport, which is the Providence Inter Airport, Providence, Rhode Island, uh, that Antonoff took off with a, a yacht, and as you can see plainly on the bow there, on the uh, on the wrapping, that it's the American Magic, and it, they later confirmed it's their AC-75. And now we can tell you that Lunarosa's AC-75 is going to be launched 
christening, you might call it a christening, you might call it a something else, but party, if you're not Christian, but uh, their launching party is going to be in Colliery at their base on the 13th of April, and it's going to include, as they did for their last, uh, the AC 75 that they did for the last cup, mm -hmm. it includes live television coverage. Good. So it'll be live stream. And here is the video without any English, but you can read the subtitles, I think, better than I. Diversamente di un aereo, noi non abbiamo una potenza on demand, diciamo, non possiamo dare tutta la potenza che vogliamo alla barca, quindi dipende di quanto spingiamo con i foli e quanto spingiamo con le vele. Sono Andrea Suare, sono architetto navale all'interno del team di una rossa Prada Pirelli. Io sono Matteo Ledri e mi occupo della parte fluidodinamica all'interno del team. Una rossa eh, riesce a volare grazie ai foil, che sono delle ali che si trovano sott'acqua e sono molto simili alle ali di, di un aeroplano. A differenza di un aereo, eh, essendo nell'acqua, che è molto più densa, possono essere più piccole, quindi non sono grandi come le ali di un aereo. Il funzionamento è lo stesso. Raggiungendo una certa velocità, sono in grado di creare una forza verso l'alto che permette alla barca di sollevarsi. Quando la barca si solleva, lo scafo non tocca più l'acqua, si riduce molto la resistenza e quindi il potenziale di velocità della barca aumenta molto. Il controllo normalmente dei velisti viene fatto tramite un flap, che è simile a quello degli aerei, e loro devono controllare costantemente questo flap, l'angolo di incidenza, perché la barca ha variazioni costanti di velocità e di assetto, poi sono più efficienti a un certo tot di, di nodi. L'equipaggio si deve mettere in un angolo efficiente normalmente a 90 gradi con rispetto al vento, e deve lavorare con le vele e con il foil per mantenere la barca in un equilibrio che è circa 0 gradi di sbandamento e cercare di accelerare piano piano del modo più efficiente dando la più potenza che possono con le vele ma senza spingere troppo con il foil. Una volta che sono arrivati a una velocità di decollo tra 18 e 23 nodi loro possono spingere il flap e cercare di decollare per aumentare la velocità ulteriormente. Ogni parte della barca è cambiata rispetto al passato perché il potenziale di velocità è più grande, le forze in gioco sono molto più grandi, però dobbiamo cercare di avere delle componenti sufficientemente piccole perché non frenino, quindi avere poca resistenza. Questo sviluppo è sia nella parte idrodinamica sia nei foil che sono nell'acqua, anche nella parte che è nell'aria, tipo lo scafo o le vele, ho dovuto cambiare perché le velocità del vento apparente cresce tantissimo. Il tempo dell'imbarcazione dell richiede una serie di professionalità molto variegata perché abbiamo un gruppo che si occupa della parte più legata alle performance, quindi le forme esterne, le forme di foil, la parte di fluido di idrodinamica, la parte delle vele, quindi una, una aerodinamica ottimale. Poi la barca deve essere sufficientemente robusta in modo da essere leggera e non a rompersi, quindi abbiamo un team strutturale che si occupa di tutte le analisi e della costruzione della barca. Ogni componente che si muove ha bisogno di sistemi di controllo, quindi c'è cioè, sia la parte di sistema hardware che l'interfaccia con i velisti, quindi qui anche il rapporto con i velisti diventa molto importante perché loro sono i piloti e devono avere un sistema di controllo che sia il più semplice possibile da usare e anche il più efficace. Abbiamo un rapporto continuo con i velisti che sono il nostro cliente finale Dobbiamo ricevere tutti i feedback dall'acqua per cercare di migliorare l'imbarcazione e ottenere il massimo delle prestazioni. That's it. Sort of an unceremonious end to that, that video, which is obviously not about their launch ceremony. There is another video, which I would, at the last minute didn't include because it was not all that good. I'm hoping for something... 16 by 9 instead of a vertical video that comes out. Several of you sent me this, this other one, and I, not this one, but an, another one that I, I didn't stick in the show about their launch. But you get the idea. If I go back a slide here, um, again, that launch ceremony is, where is it? There it is, is on the 13th of April, and they will have live TV from Kyrie. And it was quite a festive, fun thing. They did some good interviews, good quality last time they did it. And I hope that will be the same for this next one. They always do things with great style. And, and, I'm, and they've been so close. I, I'm a great fan of, of theirs. 
Well, we haven't we haven't said much about them, so we'll see what's coming out of the Italians. I know a lot of people have them as sentimental favorites. They've been in the cup now. This is um, Six. his sixth time, right? Mm-hmm. Patrizio Bertelli. So he is eclipsed or he's surpassed, I yeah. should say. Yeah. The, the Thomas Lipton. Thomas Lipton, exactly right. Who did it? Five times. Challenged five times. Yeah. Good stuff. And was ordered a, a, an honorary um, member of the New York Yacht Club. Yeah. An honorary member, not, yeah. a, not a regular member. Oh, no. He could have joined. <laughs> Pay his money and he yeah. could have joined. Uh, any other comments here before we wrap this one up? The French guns are remarkably good condition to repel Vikings or any other invading threats. Most have only been dropped once. <laughs> okay, oh, man. Right. Well said, Jonathan Shore. Uh, David James, pillage uh, up above that. Pillage before you burn. I have to add to the other two lessons I teach my sons. Pillage before you burn. Oh, bloody hell. Mm-hmm. Luca Craig, I saw on TV New Zealand News the other day that Sir John Kerwin, uh, who was a very famous rugby player here in New Zealand and does a lot for mental health, his son is, in the Italian, is on the Italian America's Cup team and had never sailed on a boat before. He's a grinder, a.k.a. cyclor. Sir John's wife is Italian. So nice connection. Thank mm-hmm. you for that tidbit, mm-hmm. Luca Craig down in New Zealand. And again, Julie, we could not put these shows together without the FOSI. Indeed, oh, absolutely. Indeed, we would not put these shows together if it weren't for the FOSI. And for them. That's what I mean. With and not, for them. With and for. Luna Rosa always does events with class. Mm-hmm. That is the case, Ed Worley. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a couple of wrap-ups here in Whiskey Tango Fox. <laughs> I want a bottle of wine. Apropos that whole segment up in Paris uh, at, at eight, uh, the year 845. I want a bottle of wine. What year? Things could get pretty nasty if I don't get it this year. <laughs> <laughs> and Captain Jack himself <laughs> sent mm-hmm. that, John uh, Schaefer. And finally, Julia, get your finger ready, yes. because this next one, if anybody was wondering how Easter eggs are made, uh-huh. we have it <laughs> in, uh, uh-huh. you know, if a picture's worth a thousand words, that from who else but Ted Ryan? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In Great Britain, who is a Brit who now lives in the Republic of South Africa. That doesn't deserve a finger wag, you don't oh, think? Oh, it does. It does. <laughs> it does. <laughs> it lightened up the end of the show. It lightened up for me. Yes. I've always wondered. <laughs> you have? Now you know. <laughs> now I know. Now you know, Julia. <laughs> Stingray, half the crew members on all these AC-75s have never been on a yacht before. Well, I don't know if that's true, but... The grinders. A good, a good number of them are experts at, yeah, they're not grinding. They are cyclers. Cyclers, yeah. Napoleon was defeated by Ra. Okay, Grimsby. <laughs> mm-hmm. I like that. I thought that. That's clean, isn't it? You don't know what's going on. Yeah, it looks like cuddles. the rabbit's just a cuddle, yeah? yeah? And for Stingray and all the rest of you are wondering if I was going to bring this up <laughs> and when I was going to bring it up, yes, the non-sailing CEO has got to go. And a reminder that we'll have John Bertrand with us on Tuesday to talk about his view of reality and all of that madness that's going on as U.S. Sailing has not yet withdrawn their lawsuit. Oh, the CEO is gone. Look at that. He disappeared from our slide. Oops. <laughs> bingo, Rick Banero saying, yeah, yeah, bingo. They find what, uh, let the record shows an hour and 43 minutes and 40 seconds into the show. Mm-hmm. Julio, we are to the finish line, and you like to say... Yes, please, like, follow, and share, and particularly share, because to your own uh, friends list. On your Facebook page. On your Facebook page. And you can do the next one, too. Comments are welcome anytime, especially in replay or even in replay. Yes, even. I think the interesting development is that more and more people who do YouTube videos. Right. And, you know, YouTube videos, the great m- m- bulk of them still. Right. They've gone from long ones, you know, 10 minutes, 12 minutes, longer. Now they're doing these short, these shorties, the reels, as Facebook calls them, right. the TikTok-style videos of just a few seconds. 
now more and more, and it's still not a huge number because it's difficult to do, more and more of them are live. And why are they live? Because the interaction with your viewers, yes, the commenters, in our case, the FOSI. Yeah. And it's so nice to have the cool comments from yes. all of you, and we leave it open and even in replay, as yeah. Julia said. I, I hope I, I hope everybody n realizes that everybody learns from that. Well, exactly, exactly. And Julia, you you can do this one too. Thanks for your support. Yes, Keeps and us going and oh, and oh yes, this this is Patreon. dot com slash join slash Sailing Illustrated will get you to the place where you can leave us a little money. Give us a buck or two or more. Julie is one of our biggest contributors. In fact, <laughs> she keeps the studio alive here in, in a number of ways. Thank you very much to her. And thank you to everybody who gave us audio, video, and images for today's show. We appreciate it very much indeed. Julia, any final thoughts? No. Easter I, or otherwise? Easter. I guess I, I guess not. I, I look forward to, uh, to, to bunny rabbits. Bunny rabbits. I look forward to chocolate. I eat chocolate on two days a year on Christmas when I get an Easter bunny in my little Christmas stocking, mm -hmm. and I, if I'm lucky and play my cards right, I get a chocolate Easter bunny. Whole, yes. no, and oh. it's not milk chocolate. I mean, it, it's. Dark chocolate. It's tough to find a dark chocolate Easter bunny. Yes. They're better for you, right? And I hope you all come uh, back and uh, join us on Tuesday when JB, you know, this is a slide from the last time I think he was on the show. And you can see we were using the orange lower thirds then. Mm -hmm. And he was sitting, Julia, right over there in nice. the studio mm -hmm. when he was here with us last time. Yep. And he's back and he's going to explain why he thinks U.S. sailing actually is justified in getting rid of Kayard and the rest of that gang from America One Racing and taking it over themselves. He would like to be a part of that, he says, and he's offered up a plan, which a lot of people are studying, and he's going to articulate that plan for us on Tuesday's show. Same time, same oh, channel. I look forward to that. Yeah. Hope you will all join us. Thank you to Jonathan Shore, who's already shared the show. Stingray is looking forward to bunny eggs. Thanks to everybody. Happy Easter, everyone. Indeed, that's the final slide of today's show. Those of you who are celebrating it, we want to wish you a blessed, peaceful, and very happy Easter. In the meantime, we hope to see you on Tuesday, same time, same channel. 1300 Pacific Daylight Time, 2000 UTC. I know the times are changing now around the world as you go on summertime in Europe and off summertime down under. I'll leave it to you to figure that out. In the meantime, sail fast, sail safe, have fun. Ciao for now.